Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar that we've entitled National Banking in Times of Crisis. Uh, today we're facing some serious economic challenges in the United States. We have recession fears that were brought on by rising inflation and the increase in interest rates. We have banking instability. We've had three regional banks here in the US uh, run into issues. And then of course the global uh, giant Credit Suisse who was um, uh, acquired by another um, banking entity. Uh, today, CEO of JP Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon, warned that the banking crisis is not over and that we can expect more issues to come up. And then of course, along with that, we have a conglomerate of other issues, lack of affordable housing, supply chain issues, wages not keeping up with inflation, the cost of healthcare, there's a, a whole list of economic challenges that are facing our country. But in the midst of this, we've had a resurgence of interest in public banking. And so today we're very fortunate to have some experts on the subject of public banking here with us today. So we have Ellen Brown, who is the chair of the Public Banking Institute. We have Stephen Fenberg, author and filmmaker and expert on the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was critical um, uh, critical in bringing our country back from the Great Depression. And we have Alfeka Mutardi, senior economist formerly with the International Monetary Fund and now the chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. My name's Julie Olson. I'll be your moderator today. I'm a, a business person from Alaska, also chair of the uh, Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats. And thank you for being here. So with that, we're gonna go to, right to our first speaker. Alfeka, tell us about the National Infrastructure Bank legislation. Um, my name is Alfeka Mutardi. I'm a macroeconomist, and um, I would like to open today's discussion, uh, which, is, which we've uh, entitled National Banking in a Time of Crisis, sort of set the table a little bit by uh, dis describing our overall picture uh, for our economy and uh, where we're at uh, uh, in, this, in this picture. Uh, I'd like to open by, by saying something overall from the macroeconomic point of view, uh, what constitutes a national crisis? And then how do we measure that we're entering into one or we're nearing one? Uh, and there are several sort of macroeconomic um, um, data points that we need to keep track of uh, that uh, indicate if our economy is really going bad. And these economic data points are used to assess actually economies all over the world, and they're used historically to assess our own economy. So these are the ones that I um, have, um, have set out and I would like to describe to you. Uh, the first is an economy that has high and growing national debt. Um, why is it high and growing? Is because um, our budgets uh, are spending more than they're earning. And year after year, they're spending even more than they're earning. And then they're putting all of this extra spending uh, and deficits onto the national debt um, um, monitor. They're issuing treasuries and those treasuries are increasing in size. Normally the way we measure this is uh, national debt per GDP uh, so that we can compare it over years without um, you know, the, the picture of inflation being in there. But um, what, what this national debt does is uh, fundamentally it squeezes out the ability of any budget to finance capital expenditures or other important um, spending through the budget. And um, because we're spending it on servicing our debt or at least servicing the, um, the interest on the debt. And uh, when it's growing, that shows that we have a structural budget problem, which normally uh, refers to the fact that we're not growing our GDP enough so that we're collecting taxes on it. Uh, and um, we're spending more than um, uh, our, uh, our budget allows. A second big factor uh, that points to a national crisis is war. War has high budgetary expenditures. It needs mobilization. And it can uh, cause, um, you know, destruction in, if it takes place within uh, countries' boundaries. So uh, this is a big uh, uh, problem for a national crisis. And a lot of these um, fundamentals here are related to each other. 
Another um, um, uh, monitor to keep track of is ex non-existing or dilapidated public infrastructure or the lack of a manufacturing base. Uh, we need these uh, things for public infrastructure, for business and economic growth. Uh, we need them for transportation to get ourselves around. We need them for clean drinking water, those kinds of things. We need schools to educate our workforce. Uh, if we haven't got those things, then our economy is going to be on the decline. High unemployment or workers unable to support their families is another critical um, factor that we have to keep track of. Uh, what it does is create social suffering and political unrest. Here's a picture of what it looked like in the depression era when we had very high unemployment and bread lines and uh, uh, you know social unrest um, that could have even re resulted in a civil war if FDR hadn't taken care of it with very judicious policies. And then a final um, uh, monitor that we wanna keep track of is a financial crisis. Uh, why is a financial crisis important uh, to our economy? Because business uh, banks, if they're operating normally, are, are providing credit to consumers and businesses that allows them to go out and you know, purchase things that they need and uh, that keep, keeps our economy humming along. If there is a financial crisis, and we've had many of them in our nation's past, that makes a recession longer and deeper and people stay unemployed for a longer period of time. So how have we gotten out of these crises? By using a public Hamiltonian bank. We've had four really large ones in our nation's past, starting after the American Revolutionary War, when we had very high debt and absolutely no manufacturing or transportation means in our country, all the way through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which helped to get us out of the Great Depression in World War II. And what I would point out about these banks is that they have been a big factor in complementing the budget to build out our capital base and our manufacturing sectors, and uh, they have stimulated the economy to such an extent that we were able to grow out of our debt. Um, another, um, uh, um, excuse me, another um, uh, factor that we have to keep track of is losing our American competitiveness. This was very much on Alexander Hamilton's mind. Uh, after we won the American Revolutionary War from the British, but we had no manufacturing and we were still in an agrarian economy that wanted to be, the British wanted to treat like a, uh, um, like a, uh, another colony to provide tobacco and that kind of things. He was having none of that. He wanted to build a manufacturing base and he did it with the National Infrastructure Bank. Today, it's been 70 years since we've had a bank like this. And we have lost our competitive net edge. All of our manufacturing has shifted overseas, mostly to this, uh, to China and other um, uh, Asian countries. And uh, even our ability to build things has waned. Uh, this is a very unfortunate picture from a blogger, a UK blogger who explained, ex he lives in China now, he exclaims, China has years of experience building world-class metro systems and America simply can't match that level of expertise. Well, that's not quite the, that's not quite the truth. We can do that. We can match uh, expertise in building infrastructure and in building manufacturing, but we need a national infrastructure bank to help us along with that. And it's no surprise that he put out pictures like the Shenzhen Metro Station in China, which is a work of art. And it's only one Metro Station and a whole long line along that Metro line, uh, which were built using uh, development banks like our national proposed National Infrastructure Bank and compare that to our, say, New York City Metro, which is over 100 years old. We can't simply manage to extend the thing even with one subway line on the Second Avenue subway. It's dilapidated, dark, dingy, and uh, we can build these things, but we need mobilization and financing to do it. Here's another example of where our National Infrastructure Bank will fully complement our capital spending on our budget. This is a comparison of what the NIB will finance and provide compared to the bipartisan infrastructure law that passed over a year ago. You, you can see that this was through the budget 
And it kept getting made, made smaller and smaller and smaller because uh, those operating the budget didn't want to extend taxes to pay for more infrastructure. Our National Infrastructure Bank can top up and provide all the spending we need in every single category we need. Not only the 16 categories covered by the American Society of Civil Engineers report card, but also other important categories that we need for infrastructure, public housing, uh, high-speed rail, broadband everywhere, and large water projects to uh, protect our food supply. Those kinds of things are things that the National Infrastructure Bank can work on. Now, the big news, of course, as, uh, as Julie pointed out, is that we are now on the cusp of a financial crisis. And believe you me, we're only at the beginning of it. Uh, um, there's one top economist uh, from, Stern, from New York Stern School of Business um, 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 who, who predicts that uh, it could get much, much worse on account of those high debt levels, the Fed has kept easy money too too low and interest rates too low for too long. Everybody, zombie companies took on uh, lots and lots of debt. Now they won't be able to pay it back. We've had already a financial crisis in a couple of banks that were taken over by regulators. Um, we've had runs on banks. We haven't seen that since the Great Depression. Here's the run on SVB Bank in, uh, in California. Moody's invest, it's gotten so bad that Moody's investor service has cut it rate its ratings of the entire banking system uh, to from stable to negative. And uh, as Julie mentioned, we've had a takeover of a very significant systemically important bank uh, in Europe's uh, Credit Suisse that was bought out at a big, huge loss for its investors. Why is all of this important? Because when you have a financial crisis on top of a recession, it makes the it makes the recession deeper, more unemployment, and longer, a longer period of time for us to come out of that unemployment period. So that's where we are now. We are in a crisis economy. We, we don't have the high unemployment that some crises have characterized. We have a tight labor market so far. But we have a large swath of our employees who are not able even to support themselves. Their wages are going down, their rents are going up, their food is going up. They're now the, the Saudis are going to cut back production and raise oil prices once more. Um, all of these things, we have a low, low manufacturing base. Uh, we have crumbling infrastructure everywhere. And this Fed, reckless Fed policy that's actually breaking the banking system it's going to hurt businesses, state and local governments, finances, and the stock market, and won't even it won't even cure the supply side problems that are causing inflation. So, what can our National Infrastructure Bank do today to get out of it? A, a National Infrastructure Bank that will fix all of our infrastructure can also lean against any recession. Anybody that gets uh, uh, made unemployed out of this recession, can be hired up to do these great paying jobs. We can start uh, with all the file cabinets full of projects that haven't been able to get funding so far, crumbling roads, bridges, those kinds of things. We can promote the general welfare with this bank and better mobilize and direct our investments to promote the public good. This is a feature of our of our constitution that we want to um, to that, that Alexander Hamilton mentioned in his first bank, and we want to promote um, with this National Infrastructure Bank, lean against a recession, hire people up, and train them for great paying permanent jobs, make America make again, uh, bolster our economy, vastly improve production and supply, and for goodness sake, let's get new housing for people so that they won't be not only unemployed but homeless as well. So that's what our bank can do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfeca. That was uh, really a very sobering presentation from my standpoint. Um, I want to let everyone know that we'll have an opportunity for Q&A after our speakers have all had an opportunity to do their presentations. So please hold those questions for Alfeca. We would love to give you more detailed information on the National Infrastructure Bank um, here later on in our uh, webinar. So now uh, I would like to go to uh, Stephen Fenberg, our author and filmmaker, and um, 
what you're seeing here is one of the books that he's written, Unprecedented Power. Um, I have read it. It's a fascinating book about Jesse Jones and basically, in my opinion, how he saved America from the Great Depre uh, Depression and got our country ready to be able to um, um, uh, help in World War II. So with that, we'll turn it over to Stephen. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'm so glad to follow Alfaka. Uh, because I have good news that there are solutions to all the problems that Alfeca detailed in her wonderful presentation. And the proof is in the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. It was initiated by a Republican president, Herbert Hoover, uh, who started it in 1932 to make loans to banks, insurance companies, and railroads, thinking that would restore confidence, get the wheels of the economy to turn again, but it was not nearly enough. When FDR became president, he made Jesse Jones RFC chairman, and he supercharged the RFC. And the first thing they did, which is so relevant today, is they saved the nation's banking system. When FDR was inaugurated, the financial system had completely collapsed. All the banks were closed. The RFC bought preferred stock in banks to recapitalize them so they could lend again and repay depositors. And this is a tool that was used once again in 2008. It was called TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. The federal government once again stepped in, bought preferred stock in banks to recapitalize them. All of that stock was returned both in 1933 and in 2008. The federal government made money on the effort and the United States banking system was saved. Jesse Jones would go on to say that the billion dollars that the RFC invested in banks in 1933 was the most important government expenditure during the Great Depression because it put a foundation under the economy. Otherwise, everything would have collapsed and fallen apart. Mm -hmm. So the RFC stepped in by buying this preferred stock, recapitalized the banks, but the banks wouldn't lend because they were so afraid of what had just happened to them that they sat on the cash. And Jesse Jones and, and FDR would say, if you don't lend this money, the RFC will have to step in and become the lender of last resort. And that's what it did. And all of the things that Alfeca detailed that are happening today, the RFC very successfully addressed during the depths of the Great Depression. It financed the development of high-speed trains. It built bridges, aqueducts, tunnels, water systems. It brought electricity to rural America when only 20% of the people in, in farm areas had power. Uh, and then the RFC financed the uh, purchases of water pumps, toasters, radios, and fans so these people could plug into the modern age. And these were lending programs, not spending programs, which is such an important distinction between what our government does today and what we can do now to address these critical issues that we're facing in our infrastructure and in our nation, whether it's employment, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's supply chain issues. We can use the same methods and strategies that the RFC so successfully and profitably used during the Great Depression to, to do all the things that are necessary today to spread broadband access across the nation, to rebuild crumbling bridges and water systems. The RFC did it and all we need to do is look back at the successes from the past for solutions today because they worked. Within four years of FDR's inauguration, after the RFC stepped in to recapitalize the banks and then start lending to get the economy to move again, industrial output doubled within four years. Detroit was manufacturing as many cars in 1936 as it had in 1929, and unemployment dropped by 8%. All the while, war is spreading through Europe and the United States is completely unprepared. We rank 17th in the world in terms of the size of our military. But within a matter of months, we went from 17th in the world to becoming the arsenal of democracy through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. FDR turned to Jesse Jones and the RFC to begin proactively building the enormous plants that would manufacture the trucks, trains, airplanes, tanks that would 
be required to fight and win World War II. And the efforts were comprehensive. They not only made all these things, they manufactured high octane gas to, to fuel the tens of thousands of planes it was building. It cornered the market in wool and silk for uniforms and parachutes. It established schools to train aviators to fly the planes that they were building. And all of these strategies can be duplicated today to address our own problems. I couldn't help but think about this during the depths of the pandemic when we were short on ventilators and masks. And I was thinking, why don't we have an infrastructure bank that can do exactly what we did to fight and win World War II and become the arsenal of democracy? Just as President Biden said, we could have vaccinated the world if we had accepted the role of good government and embraced it to do the things that are required today. Um, all of this, this massive uh, investment that the United States government made through the RFC was eventually sold off to the private sector. For instance, the RFC owned 70% of the aviation industry by the end of World War II. It owned 100% of the rubber industry because it developed synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production, just as the Japanese captured the Pacific Islands and our source of natural rubber. All of these things could be done again today to address today's problems if we will embrace the power of good government. Or as Jesse Jones said in 1937 about economic recovery, it cannot happen if we allow ourselves to believe that our government is our enemy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Really appreciate that. Um, the slide that you're seeing right now is um, illustrating uh, Stephen Fenberg's award, Emmy Award winning film where he was, I believe, the executive producer and co-writer. So if you have a chance to um, download that film and take a look at it, uh, I think you'd find it very enlightening. OK, um, next, we're going to go to our third speaker um, for the day, and that is Ellen Brown. She is the chair of the Public Banking Institute. Uh, Ellen, take it away. Thanks, Julie and Alfeca and Stephen. Um, to share my screen. Go there. Okay, so um, as Stephen and Alfeca both pointed out, we're we've seen a, a run of bank runs, which we haven't seen for decades. Uh, but it's not our first rodeo with bank runs. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, both, uh, <clears throat> uh, they were actually do not doing anything technically wrong. Our Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said, uh, our banking system is actually sound. It's technically sound as long as we don't panic. And that's what uh, Franklin Roosevelt said. We have nothing to fear but fear, fear itself, which meant that if everybody left their money in the bank, it we would not have this, uh, <clears throat> the banks would be quite solvent. The problem is that all banks, it's the model of banking that all banks uh, <clears throat> borrow short to lend long. So they're borrowing from their depositors and they put that money in some sort of long-term investment. Uh, in this case, in the case of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, which both went bankrupt over the same weekend, and they were the, our second and third largest um, bank runs in, hist in U.S. history. They both um, had a lot of depositors, and they put the deposits in long-term uh, treasuries, which was considered a quite safe investment. And the reason they did the long-term ones was at the time, before this last year, when, when the Federal Reserve hiked the interest rates um, by from 0.25% to 5%, which was, uh, I guess that's 20, 20 times a uh, factor of 20. So nobody expected that sort of increase in interest, interest rates. So <clears throat> up until that time, this, so they put it in long-term uh, investments because they couldn't make any return on short-term investments because interest rates were so low. Um, but of course, then these long-term investments, when in, I guess Sil uh, Silicon Valley Bank had a run of, there was an effort to take out 20% of their deposits in two days. So no bank 
no bank could withstand that. I mean, even when we had a reserve requirement, we don't even have a reserve requirement right now, but when we did, um, it was only 10%. So you only had to have enough liquidity around to cover 10% of the depositors coming for their money at the same time. So if 20% come, they would all be in serious trouble. And uh, Roosevelt uh, saved the day, as Stephen points out, with um, FDIC insurance. Well, the, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did make loans to the banks, but that was not sufficient. So what Roosevelt did was take the dollar off the gold standard. So you can't say that the problem was that we had a currency that was unbacked, as some people say, because it was backed. It was backed by gold, and that was the problem. There was not enough gold to meet all these withdrawals. Um, so the other thing that was done in 1933 was uh, to establish the um, Federal Federal Deposit Insurance Cor Corporation, <clears throat> which provided deposit insurance up to $100,000 at that time, and now it's up to $250,000, but that still is not enough for a Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank because most of their depositors were small businesses, small startup tech businesses, which needed more than $250,000 liquid in order to meet payroll and suppliers, et cetera, as businesses do. So this, what the Federal Reserve did to stop the bleeding temporarily, we hope it stopped, but as Alfeca points out, it's, that's not at all clear, um, was to establish the bank term funding program, which um, banks can take their long-term their long term debt, take it to this uh, bank term funding program and get a loan for the face amount of the debt, not the, not the, I mean, sorry, the face value of those treasuries, not what they're worth now if they were sold at, on the market. But then the problem is, what do you do a year from now when those loans are due? It, I mean, it's only a temporary fix. But for the time being, the short term problem has been fixed. And but we still have the problem that banks are not lending. They're afraid to lend. They're, they've raised their uh, lending requirements. So we need something for the long end, and the National Infrastructure Bank can step in and do that as um, as the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did. What the, Recon the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was really an extension of the American system that dates already all the way back to pre-revolutionary times, if you count the fact that, so the American system was basically sovereign money and sovereign credit, uh, that we, the American people, would create our own money and our own credit in order to liberate ourselves from um, the British banking system and the British colonial empire. So we won the war with this, the Revolutionary War. We did break free of England using this system. But the problem was, <laughs> by the end of the war, we were, we were just using paper currency, the continental currency. And by the end of the war, we were $44 million in debt, which was a huge debt at that time. Um, and in fact, it wasn't really because the uh, Continental Congress was running the printing presses. It was because the British were we're doing it, but anyway, that's what happened. So Hamilton, who was our first treasury secretary under Washington, uh, saved the day with this clever arrangement of doing debt for equity swaps. And that's the same thing that the, that the national infrastructure would do today. Uh, so state debt was accepted and partial payment for stock in that first US bank. And then the bank leveraged this capital into credit. And that's what all banks do today. Uh, and that credit that was issued on the books of the banks was issued as paper currency. So that was our first U.S. currency. There's a picture of it down at the bottom. Uh, so we did not actually originate this model where banks can lend, <laughs> lend money they don't have, the fractional reserve model that it was originated by the, by the goldsmiths in Europe and then picked up officially by the Bank of England, but the Bank of England was using it for something else. It was more for speculative purposes. And the purpose of the first US bank was to issue credit to the government and private interest for internal improvements and other economic development, according to 
Hamilton system of public credit. And again, that's what we'd be doing with the NIB. So it was a national infrastructure and development bank. And so was the second uh, US bank and that got a lot of productivity going, including the Erie Canal, which was probably the most impressive of <laughs> the achievements of that era. Uh, but Jackson was obviously opposed and he shut the second U.S. bank down. So when Lincoln came into office, he was faced with a civil war and no way to fund it. Uh, and the British, well, the British backed banks, I think the New York banks that were, were connected to British bank funding, uh, would have been lending at exorbitant interest rates of about 30%. So that would have left us in serious debt. And again, we would have been basically enslaved to England, um, economically enslaved to England, as we see many third world countries are today enslaved by debt. Um, so what Lincoln did and said was he resorted, went reverted to the original system of the American colonists and just printed paper money. These are called greenbacks or US. Anyway, it was greenbacks uh, and founded the national bank system, which again used um, bank notes or, or used government debt to capitalize the banks. They, they were issued bank notes that said United States at the top. They still could keep their own. The, they could keep their own um, name of their own bank, or they they were still issuing their own paper money, but it said uh, national currency on the top. But and in order to do that, <laughs> that in order to continue to issue their own currency, before that we had a, just a, a bunch of wildcat banks that were issuing their own currency, and. Um, they were taxed 10% in order to continue to issue their own paper currency. So what they did was they started issuing it just by writing the money into their deposit into the deposit accounts of the borrowers. And that's how we got our current system. Um, so th through this, this device, Lincoln was Lincoln's government was able to win the war and also uh, financed a great deal of economic uh, development. Uh, again, the most impressive thing was the Transcontinental Railroad, where uh, the entire country was linked by linked by this railroad. By 1869, it was completed, and not only was it a great, a great stimulus to development, but it actually returned a profit to the government. Um, agriculture was mechanized, so uh, it flourished and. Factory output boomed and harbor improvements. So these are just a few of the improve, of the <clears throat> developments funded by the American system of uh, government issued money and credit. And during all that, this is a bit controversial, but uh, even Milton Friedman said in um, his book with Anna Schwartz that the printing of the greenbacks was not inflationary. That there would the greenback did devalue relative to gold, but so that that was typical of wartime. It was a it was a supply, uh, it was a problem of limited supply, which caused prices to go up. And you can't I don't know if you can see this chart, but I can't see the arrow or the red line. But anyway, the red line's flat all the way up until uh, the Vietnam War, and that's when it shoots up. So inflation or the inflation level stayed flat all through that. So today, with banks afraid to lend and Congress gridlocked over the debt ceiling, we need a 1930s-style workaround. The antidote to cost-push inflation is not to cut demand, but to increase productivity. Like in the Great Depression, crises are when politicians are open to major changes. So that's what I'm hoping, that the good of all these crises is that we do need to change the system. We can see that it's um, fragile at best. And but things never change when they seem to be going along fairly well because politicians are just averse to change. They want to keep their positions, et cetera. They don't want to rattle the boat. But when things fall apart, that's when they start looking around for alternatives. 
we can rebuild the country, restore middle class, and create a 21st century renaissance with a national infrastructure bank. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to Ellen, Alfeca, and Stephen for those presentations. Uh, I thought they were very interesting. Now, uh, we'd like to open it up for questions and answers. So if you have a question or a comment um, for any of our speakers, please raise your hand. And um, while we're waiting for those hands to go up, I'd like to ask Ellen if she could give us um, sort of a brief rundown on what's um, happening with um, state banking and this whole resurgence in interest in public banking in general. Just a little overview. Okay, well, we only have one state-owned bank, that's the Bank of North Dakota, but North Dakota has weathered this whole, I mean, they don't have bank runs that the nature of the Bank of North Dakota is that by law, all of the um, state's revenues are deposited in the bank. And then the Bank of North Dakota acts as a mini Fed for the for the commercial banks. So the, the commercial banks are still private. They're not public, obviously, and they still have FDIC insurance. But the Bank of North Dakota does not have FDIC insurance. It's backed by the state. Um, and it then helps the local banks with liquidity. It helps them with... Um, <laughs> capitalization it have to help them with regulations so it can step in and prevent uh the smaller banks from losing these large loans that would all otherwise go to wall street banks and of course it was set up in 1919 when we were when they were going through their own sort of depression or recession with the agriculture was in trouble uh, so so that's the basic model and um Right now, there's this, this sort of movement for what's called sovereign state banks, which are also public state banks, but I think it's sort of a, because it's a conservative movement, they don't want to use the word public, so they say sovereign. But anyway, it's the state of Tennessee, and there's some other interest in other states that would be doing the same thing. Basically, if you have, if you can keep your money in the state, that's the whole idea. You're sovereign, you're creating your own credit which goes to, into productivity in the state for your own productive purposes and the profits go back to the people and there's the shareholder is the state so so you don't have private investors bleeding off profits etc and then we have quite a bit of i mean we've had over the last 12 years we've had over 50 bills for uh, local publicly owned banks and we're still working that, on those in a number of states. So, yeah, I mean, it's there's a lot of interest right now because things are delicate and people are looking around for alternatives. Oh, and I should say, North Dakota, they have more local banks than any other state. And that that is what we need. A lot of local banks that know your local economy and can make loans to your local economy, similar to... Um, what they do in Germany with the um, Sparkhausen banks. Wonderful. Thank, thank you for that explanation, Ellen. Um, uh, I see we've got a couple people with their hands up, but I um, quickly wanted to call on uh, Representative Sean Brennan from Ohio, who is on the call, I do believe. And uh, represent, Representative Brennan was uh, instrumental in getting our resolution um, introduced and um, there in Ohio. Representative Brennan, could you um, share a few words with us? Yeah, well, thanks for the presentation. I appreciate it. It's always good uh, hearing that history. I, I was a history teacher and um, <clears throat> it's uh, it would be nice to have history repeat itself in this case, right? So, um, so <laughs> I've, joined, uh, I've joined with Michelle Grimm. Uh, she's a, a, a freshman uh, member of the Ohio House of Representatives. Uh, from the Toledo area, north uh, northwest Ohio, I, I represent Parma, Parma Heights, and a few neighborhoods in the west side of Cleveland, over in northeast Ohio, <clears throat> and uh, and we're out there uh, uh, gaining uh, bipartisan support for uh, for the legislation. In fact, we sent out another co-sponsor request today, and uh, we're going to be contacting our colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle in hopes of uh, of bolstering that support. Wonderful. Thank you, Representative Brennan. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, go to one of our uh, folks in the audience who's got his hand up. Uh, Earl, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, yes, I do. Um, thanks very much for the presentations. Uh, Steve, I read your book with uh, great interest, 
And another tidbit factor is that uh, the president of our Senate in Colorado is named Stephen Fenberg. <laughs> uh, I gave him a copy of your book. I also gave a congressman <laughs> from Colorado, Joe, Joe Neguse, a copy of your book and strongly urge them to support public banks. But one thing I would like very much to, to have is, um, and I assume you may have obtained this, and that is the balance sheets and income and expense statements of the um, Reconstruction Finance Corporation and their footnotes if, if they're available. And I, I did a little preliminary search and I wasn't able to get them through the archives that I knew of, but can you tell us if those are available? Did you access them and uh, what would I need to do to get them? Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, first of all, for your nice compliments about my book and uh, to giving it to other people to read. I really appreciate that very much. Uh, I did not access the financial statements of the RFC. Instead, I interviewed David Ginsburg, who was an attorney with the RFC during the time mm -hmm. of Jesse Jones. And uh, he's interviewed in the <laughs> film, A Brother, Can You Spare a Billion? And he talks about how the RFC, you know, balanced its books and wow. accounted for everything to the penny and uh, how it was profitable throughout the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. The documents that you're asking about are in the National Archive. I mean, I, I went through the Library of Congress. I did look through some of the papers at the National Archive, but they are extensive. They're massive. <laughs> I was just one person doing research uh, for this book. So unfortunately, I was not able to access those documents, but they are available at the National Archive, as far as I know. Okay, yeah. Uh I would love to get contact information for um, Attorney Ginsburg. I'm, uh, I think he has since. I think everybody I interviewed in that film in '98 has mostly <laughs> passed away. Uh, oh, that's... Check and see, uh, but I don't believe uh, David Ginsburg is with us any longer. I mean, like John Kenneth Galbraith, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. They were all in the film, and I'm so glad that I got to capture their. Uh, memories because John Kenneth Galbraith worked with Jesse Jones during World War II and had great stories to tell about him. Yes. No. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Stephen. We're going to we're going to move on. We've got some more um, um, questions. Uh, next, we're going to go um, over to um, Washington State. We have Ruth Fruland from Seattle who's got her hand up. Ruth, do you have a question or a comment? Um, both, actually. <laughs> um, okay. First of all, uh, I'd like to mention that I went to a public banking symposium at Willamette University in Oregon um, uh, a week ago, uh, maybe two weeks ago by now. Um, and it was very fascinating. It was put on by Rowan Gray, who is a lawyer in the, in the law department, but it was cross uh, departments. So it pulled in management and um, uh, as well as who was the other one? Well, in any event, it was cross uh, uh, cross discipline, so that was very good. When it gets put up, I'll send uh, you all the link to that because there were some really interesting uh, speakers um, at the forum. The uh, next thing I wanted to uh, mention was that Massachusetts has got two banking bills, public bank bills, one in the Senate and one in the House. And I was wondering if anyone here is from uh, that part of the world and can talk about how those are progressing. So that was a question. And then I had uh, one other question that was just related to order of paying off depositors. Uh, when, if you have less than 250 K in a bank, are you automatically assured that you will get paid off or is there an order to paying off uh, depositors that might somehow still leave small depositors out in the cold? That's a, that's a good question, Ruth. Uh, Alfeca, can, do you have an answer for that? I aren't, aren't all depositors who have um, right. at least 250,000 guaranteed the, yeah. uh, access to their money? That's true in, in theory. Uh, the problem is the other depositors that are not insured are kind of weighing down the FDIC system. 
So altogether, what's in the FDIC fund right now is about 1.7, um, uh, is it billion, I guess? Um, it's not much, uh, but we have 17 trillion in deposits overall. And of that 17 trillion, we have 3 trillion that are not insured in large banks. So if there's a run on any of those large banks, then that could affect um, you know, the payment uh, of the of the smaller ones. The uh, There's no order as long as they have under $250,000 to get their money back, given that the there's enough money in the fund to cover everybody in a crisis, in a total crisis. Okay, thank you, uh, Alfeca. All I right. Think, can We're I add something? On. I think I saw that they, you know, sure. if you had four, I think four runs on banks equivalent to Silicon Valley Bank, you would use up the fund. <laughs> so then, so then even the insured depositors would be in trouble. Now, hopefully the FDI, or sorry, the Federal Reserve would step in and backstop the whole thing. But anyway, that is a problem. And, and if I can add one more thing to that, that's where the beauty of the RFC comes in. And it's uh, what Jesse Jones called the bank repair program or what we called TARP in 2008. An infrastructure bank can fill those gaps, God forbid we need to, by recapitalizing banks by buying their preferred stock. We should just keep that, we should keep that in our back pocket in case we need it. Thank you. It's one of the benefits of having a panel of experts here is that we can get our questions fully answered. All right. Um, Next, we have another person from Seattle who's been very active in the movement for to create a national infrastructure bank. Ingrid, you've got your hand up. Do you have a question or a comment? I have I have both. Um, okay. First, I'd like to thank everybody for all of your efforts. And what I'd like to say with this group is to try to maybe um, invite more people so that they could, you know, understand what we're talking about. I just feel like maybe the the more public that knows that understands this will also help influence their representatives and my question is um uh, and I, this more towards alfec i think it's it's is it what are, what's the difference i know what the difference is with a federal and a state public bank is it good to have both or do you think the federal is best because the amount of money you can collect. So I'm just curious. I don't know how that works. So I, I think Julie, I mean, I think Ellen should also comment on this, but I, it is, I think that it's better to have both. First of all, the National Infrastructure Bank, as it's configured now, will be large enough to cover all of our infrastructure needs, specifically target that money to go into infrastructure use. And it's also big enough to move the needle on the economy. Uh, and then it can also do things like go across state lines, build a whole well-planned high-speed rail system, for example, build a whole well-planned water grid system to protect the Southwest, those kinds of big projects uh, the uh, National Infrastructure Bank can do. But we're still going to need boots on the ground and local banks and local public banks to uh, guide uh, the whole secondary business that's going to come off of this construction of uh, this construction activities, and there'll be a lot of it. So you, you can imagine that uh, you hire a construction firm to fix a road, and that has that construction firm has to go out and get supplies, has to buy caterpillar tractors, uh, all those kinds of things. Uh, those those small uh, banks can um, work on. <clears throat> financing the secondary business projects, and they can also be storefronts for the big large bank and represent the big large bank um, with state and local governments because it knows their needs better. And so there'll be a lot of um, complementarity between those those two. Um, I, uh, I was just thinking that uh, New Mexico, some of those people in New Mexico, had they seen that um, presentation that you had about water mm -hmm. and what you guys were thinking uh, uh, projects on water. I mean, that would have been a perfect uh, thing for them to see. So we we have to get more people to watch some of this, you know, and get interested. 
Yes, in your well, commentary, I'm sorry, Julie, in your commentary about um, broadening the exposure of this bank, we use a whole suite of different uh, strategies. This particular Zoom call is one strategy where we can just broadly uh, bring people to me to meetings and they typically up happen to be, uh, you know, people that are interested, people who are activists, uh, people who want to call up their congressman and push for this bill. But at the same time, we do one on one meetings with a whole lot of legislators, not only in New Mexico, but Arizona, Nevada, all those states, California, that are very going to be impacted by the drying up, for example, mm -hmm. of the Colorado River. Nobody's got their eyes focused on that at all. And so we use every single strategy and that's why we need you as volunteers to help with these calls as well, these one-on-one -on -one calls. I'd, I'd like to encourage everyone to share our invites with your social media and your, uh, your influencer groups. And so definitely the more exposure we can get for the National Infrastructure Bank, the more education we can do, uh, the, better, um, the better we'll be. So thank you for your comments, Ingrid. Uh, next, I'd like to go with Andy Winnick. Andy, Andy, you've got your hand up. Do you have a question yeah. or a comment? Yes, I do. Uh, let me make a couple of comments. There needs to be a distinction in people's minds between the National Infrastructure Bank and public banks. Those are not the same thing. Uh, California has passed a law which authorizes the creation of 10 public banks regionally in the state. Uh, and uh, the, the idea here would be Right now, all the local governments put their money when they're, you know, when they have tax money, federal money, state money in large banks that then use them, use that money any way they please until the banks, uh, the local local authorities take the money out. The idea here would be to put the local money or at least a significant hunk of the local money into a public bank and that the, the, the boards of directors of those public banks in each region would be appointed by the local governments and then would operate as a bank with a focus on infrastructure projects that were local, uh, affordable housing, uh, minority banking, minority businesses, and what have you. But that's a different model, that I believe, than the National Infrastructure Bank in terms of where you're, where you're proposing to get the money. You're talking about basically doing bonding with, uh, from, from, the, from some of the states. And, and there's a, a difference between that national infrastructure model and the state and local public banks. And I think we need both. And that, that's just the point I want to make. Yeah, can I add? I would agree. Yeah. And they actually are sort of in two different circles of things going on. But we have the German model where um, the, with their green program uh, of turning energy green, the, the Sparkassen banks work, worked with their national infrastructure. They have a very large national infrastructure bank. And they work together. Uh, so again, the, the Sparkassen banks are the boots on the ground. They know the local businesses. They know who it's safe to make loans to, et cetera. And then the, the National Infrastructure Bank or <laughs> Infrastructure Development Bank uh, does the, the big projects. Thank, thanks, Alan. Appreciate that clarification. Let's move on. We have uh, Nelson Betancourt with his hand up. Nelson, do you have a question or a comment? <laughs> Yes, I do. Hi. Uh, first of all, hello to uh, Anchorage, Alaska. I grew up, went to West High School and Central Middle School. Yes. All right. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, my question is to Steve. Uh, Steve, what may be some ways that you see that we can bypass the bad politics that would not allow an RFC type solution? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. I think it has to do with our attitude about government first and foremost. It seems like, you know, we think our government is our mm -hmm. enemy, that it doesn't do anything good, that it can't be productive. I think that it requires a change in attitude. Uh, about our partnership with our government. I think that's the, the most fundamental thing we can do when we talk about the, the uh, potential of a new infrastructure bank. And by looking at our past and the successes of the RFC, it was the, the world's largest corporation, the world's largest bank. It saved the United States economy and expanded it during the Great Depression and then militarized industry during World War II. 
through corporations. It always partnered with the private sector. There was an earlier question about uh, banks. The RFC always partnered with local banks, with big banks, with corporations. It always gave them first choice before it had to intervene. So I think it's really has to do with our attitude about government and how we can collaborate together as, as a public entity, as a government entity, as the private entity. And I, I, I really don't know because our politics has become so divisive that until we embrace the power of good government and, and see that as patriotic, you know, I think we have to redefine patriotism mm -hmm. uh, to, in order to make things like this happen again. Okay, there's, there's one more thing I wanna ask you. I love quotations. And you, the last quote that you gave, I was wondering if you could put it in the chat so I can write it in my commonplace book. And the other thing is that what you're talking about seems to be like a cultural change. If you can't get the economy straight and you can't get the politics straight, then you get to go to the seed, which is a cultural aspect of things. And I think the real fundamental change that has to be done is all campaigns should be publicly financed. Until yeah. they are publicly financed, our elected officials will not represent the needs of the people, only the people who put them into office. Do you have a follow-up book? Not yet. <laughs> Thank <laughs> okay. you, though, for asking. Thank okay. Thank you. I will read your book. I can't wait. Thank you so much. You bet. Thanks, Nelson. Hey, I'd like to take a moment um, to pivot. Um, Stephen was talking about developing partnerships. And one of the most important topics that we often get on these webinars is, is what are we going to do about labor training, apprenticeship programs and such. Um, and there's really a, a huge requirement that we have that partnership um, to be able to develop those programs. So we'll be able to provide a trained workforce that will be able to help us uh, make these investments in infrastructure. So I'd like to take a moment and call on Lou Spencer, who is one of our labor experts. He's out of Virginia um, and is a very active member of the coalition. Lou, could you maybe make a few comments on the, the partnerships that you would envision with uh, labor and uh, training programs? Sure. Thank you, Julie, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I got on the call late. Uh, I was on a North American Building Trade Union's uh, monthly leaders council, council call. Um, the apprenticeship programs throughout the United States stand ready to train uh, people that want to come into the trades. Um, we have free apprenticeship programs, we have helper programs, and then the apprenticeship programs themselves. Uh, one thing my local union is doing is we're also trying to train our own members to start their own businesses and become signatory contracting firms. The uh, current infrastructure bill um, is going to provide a jump start on infrastructure, but it doesn't come close to doing the work that needs to be done over the next several years. So uh, the North American building trades unions throughout the United States and elsewhere um, have wonderful training programs. Our enrollment is up. There is no age limit on apprenticeship in most cases. Um, we're actively recruiting women into the trades. And as I said, we're trying to grow our own contractor base. There's a lot of people in the trades right now that are my age, looking to retire, looking to get out. And we need to replace that uh, membership. We need to uh, recreate that contractor base. But we are so excited about the infrastructure prospects for this country. It's something that, that has to be done. So uh, if you can dream it, we can build it for you and we'll provide the people to do it. Wonderful, thank, thank you for that good news. Okay, um, next up, I'd like to call on Joe. Joe, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you have a question or comment? I do. <laughs> uh, first of all, great presentations as always. Um, I have a question for Steve. I put in the chat, well, I guess it doesn't go to the general chat, but. Um, I put in a link about um, Mariner Eccles, who was the uh, federal chair of the Federal Reserve um, during the RFC success. And uh, the link I put in was a 1939 speech to a radio speech to the public uh, about basically what we would call the household fallacy and the paradox of thrift. And, you know, uh, he was kind of... It was a Senator Byrd at the time that he was trying to set right. He had basically a debt ceiling attitude, uh, Byrd did, and he was explaining why that was a very illogical and wrong thing. 
Um, and it was really amazing that a federal chair would, uh, the Federal Reserve chair would would speak to the public that way. And he, and he spoke to uh, the captains of industry that way. Uh, he was way ahead of his time, very uh, progressive views. So my question would be for Steve about his about the RFC. Uh, have you found in your research that Eccles helped to facilitate this great success? It would seem he would have been uh, on the side of the RFC, but I wonder if you had found any research to that. You know, I, I wish I could answer you, uh, but I don't know. Uh, I do believe that in my book, there is something about Mariner Eccles. And now I've got, I just can't remember. I've got to go back and look it up and uh, see. And, you know, if you go to another question, I'll look it up right now and see what I can find. But I do believe <laughs> that Jesse Jones and Eccles were colleagues and that that Eccles did support it. But but if you don't mind, I'll if you go to another question, I'll look it up right now and see what I can find for you. Well, I really okay. appreciate it. Thanks okay. so much. I do want to say um, the other thing is, is we're also engaged in, you know, old style advertising, which is taking out advertising in local regional newspapers. We saw, we've also done a variety of ads in uh, digital um, newspapers and newsletters and that sort of thing. So we are um, working very hard in addition to our various phone calls uh, to get the word out about the National Infrastructure Bank. So anything that any of you all on this call can do to help us spread the word would uh, definitely be appreciated. So I think we'll go back to Stephen Thinberg and see if he found out about uh, Mariner, Mariner Eccles. I did, as a matter of fact. He's in my book on page 300. And uh, this is in 1938 when Roosevelt and others in his administration were trying to withdraw government support from the economy because the economy was improving. So there were people who thought that enough is enough. We need to let the economy stand on its own. Jesse Jones knew it was way too soon. And so did Mariner Eccles, who said, uh, quote, the government, Eccles said, must be the compensatory agent in the economy. He believed that government had to spend until the economy had improved and stabilized. And indeed, Roosevelt did, he, he stopped the RSC from lending in 1937, 1938, withdrew all of the a New Deal uh, spending programs, and the economy collapsed. And the first person he turned to to reverse that trend was Jesse Jones and the RFC to begin lending again. So Mariner Thanks. Eccles was in Jesse Jones's corner. Thanks so much. And he that was in the 1939 speech, uh, a radio broadcast speech. Okay, and um, I have it in my chat, and, and I, I have this uh, event happening in 1938 when Mariner Eccles makes well, a well, yes, right. He, but he, in the 39 speech, he referred to those events, and he yes. said, "See, you're this is illogical to burn, right?" right? And That's Jesse Jones said that that they, that we had stopped way too soon and uh, didn't give the economy enough time to recover. And he was the most conservative force of the New Deal primarily, but he knew that there was a role for government to play in the recovery of the economy. And so did Mariner Eccles. All right. Thank you for that um, explanation, Stephen. So, Thank um, you so much. <laughs> what I'd like to do is kind of bring us back to today and where the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank is. So we anticipate that the legislation will be reintroduced into this next Congress uh, shortly. We are working very hard at developing bipartisan support uh, for this legislation. As many of you know, in the last Congress, we had 20 co-sponsors. However, they were all Democrats. And so we're working very hard at getting Republican support. And it's been very interesting, even just over the past couple of weeks, it seems like we've been really having some great conversations with receptive Republicans. And maybe the banking crisis um, is having something to do with that, where people are wanting to look at new ideas and assess new ways of addressing some of the issues we have with our country. So we're continuing to work very hard. We have, I'd like to um, show some slides of some of the recent endorsements and some of the recent work that we've been doing. Um, so we'll just quickly scroll through these. Um, but we've got, uh, been receiving endorsements from uh, a variety of uh, states, cities, um, support in um, various parts of the country. Um, we, you just saw something from Colorado. I know we had a question about what we're doing in Colorado. So 
yes, we're doing work there in California and Washington. So we are continuing our efforts to educate the public around the country. And we really appreciate your support in helping us move this legislation forward. Uh, one of the biggest things that um, anybody on this call can do is help us get co-sponsors for the new bipartisan National Infrastructure Bank Bill. Uh, so if you are represented by a Republican in your congressional district and would like to help us uh, get an appointment to do a presentation for your representative, we would love to work with you. Please give us a call. Larry, there's our phone number. Um, here is our email address, so please feel free to contact us. Um, I do want to, um, you know, give a, a thumbs up to Alfeca, who's uh, doing multiple phone calls per day on these presentations. So um, we've um, been working on a daily basis to uh, generate more support and get the word out. So anything that you can do in your neck of the woods to uh, help us out and uh, set up some appointments with your local legislators would be much appreciated. Um, then if you go to our website, we have an action page. So our, you can see our website address there, nibcoalition.com. If you click on the link for the action page, you will see uh, a listing of some of the, the newest updates, um, the things that we're working on, the newest successes that we've had in terms of people signing on to our resolution. And um, and we also have a donut bu donate button on our website because, of course, um, paying for advertising, digital advertising, regular advertising is not free. Even putting on these uh, webinars is not free of charge. And so any of your donations would be really helpful in terms of enabling us to continue on building support for the National Infrastructure Bank. I'd also like to let everyone know that we'll be having another Zoom webinar on April 27th. That's going to be at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And as usual, we hope to bring you um, interesting information, educational information, and of course, update you on the latest um, uh, advances that we've made in terms of getting our legislation moved forward. So um, thank you, everyone. Really appreciate your attendance, and we hope to see you at future webinars. Thanks and have Thank a Thank you everybody. Day.